Look, there's been a mistake. I didn't ask for an angel to be my girlfriend. You guys sent her to me by mistake. What do you mean you can't do anything until Monday? Yeah, I know it's Easter weekend, but what am I supposed to do with her until then? No, you guys need to get an automated menu. It's 2012. Oh, there you are, Dennis. Well, what's wrong? You seem tense. It's nothing, Bell Dandy. It's just... What am I supposed to tell my parents when I bring you home for Easter dinner on Sunday? I can't just say, Oh, hey, Mom, hey, Dad, this is Bell Dandy. She just fell out of the sky and she's with me for life. But, Dennis, that's what you wished for. And it was granted. That's what the Goddess Technical Helpline was established for. Is it my fault your number and John Pokemon's cell phone number are so similar to each other? I missed out one time and boom, while I'm washing my hands in the men's bathroom, an angel pops out of the mirror. Well, that's how it works, I'm afraid. I'm sorry that I'm a burden. Is there any wish I can grant to make you feel better? Any wish? Of course. That's what I was sent here for, to grant your any given wish. Just so we're clear, you'll grant any wish I have. Uh-huh. Well then, since you're here, and since it would be a waste of a perfectly good wish, I want you to... Go on. I want you to... Be my new talk show announcer. Think you can do that? Of course. Awesome! All right, showtime. Let's go make some magic. <laughs> yes, let's. From the Jack and John Stratter Studio in beautiful CCM at the University of Cincinnati, it's the Dennis Daniel Show. Tonight's guest, voice actress Aline Stevens, and your announcer, me, Belle Dandy, and now, here's your host. He is the 2011 BearCast Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Mr. Dennis Daniel. You know, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would have a goddess as my personal announcer. Okay, so she's no Ricardo Rodriguez, but <laughs> hey, I got touched by an angel. Schwing! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, you have successfully navigated to BearCastRadio.com's greatest talk show segment, The Dennis Daniel Show. I am your host, once again, the only man in BearCast Radio history to win the Kanto, the Orange Islands, the Johto, the Hoenn, the Sinnoh, and the Innova Elite Four Pokemon Championship, and BearCastRadio.com's Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Dennis Daniel. And before I continue, let's give a big round of applause to Belle Dandy, my brand new announcer. She did pretty good for her first time out there. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. You know, little nervous, little nervous. Not prudent right now, though. But I'm excited. It's been a while. It's been about two months. And the reason we've been gone so long is because, well, first off, the server's been down, and that's never a good thing. So I've been having to fill up my time with a lot of Netflix. Ooh, Netflix. I've been watching a truckload of Saturday Night Live with John Pokemon, my, my brother. And we have picked up on so much. It's not even funny how much we have picked up on. <laughs> we, we all, for those who don't know, this guy named Dana Carvey, he's a, he's this master impersonator, and he does this one character in the 80s called the Church Lady. And, and he has on people who are in the news, and, and he does this, this cute thing. It's with a reverb, and it's so funny that I wanted to try it. So... Tonight on the Dennis Daniels Show, we have got voice actress Eileen Stevens, best known as the voice of Belle Dandy from the classic Ah, My Goddess, and currently Iris from the new anime Pokemon Black and White. 
And and, and I, I got to tell you this much. She does this um gym leader. Her name's Alisa. And she's like the electric gym leader. And, and she's got, she just got this wonderful little outfit, you know, all tiny, you know, barely covering up the naughty bits. I wonder who dresses her. Could it be Satan? <laughs> We will be doing that a lot on the show now. Wait till we get with John here. It's going to be hilarious. But anyway, Eileen Stevens, she's, first off, wow, Eileen Stevens is on the show. Excellent. And she is one of the new stars of the new Pokemon series, Iris. And Iris, she's kind of a, kind of an oddball kid. She's got these big puffs on her head and her hair down to her butt. And she, and she lets her uh, Pokemon Axew ride in her hair. First off, I got a nice jerry curl, but I wouldn't let a squirtle ride in my hair. That's just not natural. And, of course, when she falls, you know, the axe is going to have to use the hair as a seatbelt, and that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt really bad. Now, of course, aside from aside from that, she's also Tori Meadows in the, in the new Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel. Of course, with all our, our great guests, I've put together a bit of a demo reel. I think this gets her point through very nicely, so let's, uh... Let's check out her demo reel. Ouch! Ouch! Okay, what was that for? See, I was only trying to catch a Pokemon. Oh, so what you're really telling me is I look like a Pokemon. Your Pokedex. Is this cute face in there? Tell me, is it? No, uh... Whoa, no way! Pikachu? It's got to be the sweetest thing ever! It's so cute! And those jiggling cheeks! You can't find anything this jiggly in Unova! Mika, Mika! Well, I for one am dying to know what a Pikachu is doing here! Now come on, tell me, tell me, tell me! We're from Palatown in the Kanzo region! Palatown? Yeah, I'm Ash, and I want to enter the Unova League! Isn't that nice? It's nice to meet you! I'm Iris! <laughs> Why do you do it, Yuma? Those dares? Why not? It's good fun. It's fun to turn green coughing up pool water? No, but that's the price you pay. That's the key your parents gave you, right? That they found on one of their expeditions? Yep. And you know what it unlocks? Potential. Isn't that cool? Really? Think it could work on me? Nope. Ugh. Why? I'm with the Goddess Helpline. Got his first class, second category, unlimited license, and my name is Belle Dandy. Oh, uh, nice to meet you. I I'm Keiichi Morisato. <laughs> we goddesses watch over each and every one of the lives that are being led on this planet. And thus, that includes you, Mr. Keiichi Morisato. Oh. Your fortitude and unbreakable spirit in the face of misfortune, and your kindness and empathy toward others, this is truly worthy uh of the highest praise. Oh, right. It's nothing special, really. But it is. You have been virtuous in spite of the fact that the imbalance of fortune and misfortune in your daily life has been exceeded. And so, as a result, Yggdrasil responded accordingly. Uh. Thus, it has been determined that you have earned the right to receive Heaven's Grace. So did I. I received Heaven's Grace, too. That's why I got Bell Dandy as my personal announcer now. My guest tonight is a up-and-coming voice actress who's best known as Belle Dandy from the popular Ah oh My Goddess series. And you can catch her every Saturday and Sunday on Cartoon Network as Iris in Pokemon Black and White. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, give it up. She is the one, the only Miss Eileen Stevens. Miss Stevens, thank you, and welcome to the Dennis Daniel Show. It's good to be part of it. Oh, uh, pay, oh sorry, there, I went deaf for a minute. But no, I, I want to thank you for being on the show. We have gotten a lot of requests to have you on the show, and just seeing those two roles right there, it, it, I don't see why we shouldn't have you on the show. You are the third Pokemon person to be on the um, program, aside from Veronica Taylor and Eric Stewart, who were on the original series. That's right. 
Iris, I got to tell you, Iris is kind of a, a wild child, and that's why I like her, because not only is she, like, crazy, she's also got crazy hair, which is like, I got crazy hair, so we're like two peas in a pot. But you don't you don't have animals living in your hair, you said. No, 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 no. I, I don't I don't cotton to have an animals in my hair, Eileen. It's because mm. because when you fall, they're gonna grab your hair like a seatbelt, and that's gonna hurt. I don't know what's gonna hurt more: hitting the ground or having them yank on your hair. It's, it, I think it could hurt. You're right. Uh, just, 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 I want to see what is inside Iris's head, just, just, just so I can see if that thing is chilling out. That little that axe who is chilling out in that, in that boy. It's just because it's got to have like a little couch or a little hammock or cod, and maybe a little television in there, a little little refrigerator with all these juices. And I've just given all these fans like a thousand different fan art, fan thick possibilities. Mm-hmm. I would have a swing set too, and maybe a water park. I yeah. heard that much hair. Yeah. It, an animal. It, it, it's just, it's just, these anime kids, it's just not natural having all that hair. How do they take care of it? I have watched that show for 15 years and I have not seen them break out one soap bar, one bottle of shampoo, one bottle of conditioner, a comb. So, uh, what, do they just leave all that at the Pokemon Center and, and we just ignore it? Or I'm just saying that personal hygiene is important when you're a Pokemon trainer. I mean, aside from doing this in the video game, you, you don't have much option to, to get your hair or your body clean in the Pokemon world, apparently. Well, you know, Simon is part of the trio, and he's, I think, very thoughtful about keeping up, you know, eating a good diet. He seems to be a chef, and I think he takes care of the wild child Iris. You know, she came from the forest. She likes to swing on vines, so I'm sure she has natural ways. Maybe she cleans her hair with certain flowers or, or berries, or, you know, she probably has her ways that we just don't see when the show is on. You know, it all it all happens off yeah, when yeah. the show isn't, isn't yeah. happening. So. But, but, but still, Eileen, Iris, but anyway, let's get right into this. What got you interested in voice acting? That's a great question. I, um, I always want, I was a singer. And I moved to New York um, in 2000, and about a year after moving here, so literally, actually two weeks before September 11th, actually, I got a job at a recording studio, and I had been doing some shows. I did a one-person show um, at a few places and got this job, and I kind of worked my way up from being an assistant to being a producer-director, um, but I was still doing some acting whenever I could, and it just so happened that sometimes I would get to step in and do the voices and I, and I wanted to, but it just, you know, I hadn't pursued it wholeheartedly because my, my focus had been in theater, but when these opportunities came up, so to play a teenager or to play an older person or, you know, someone in my, in, in her thirties or something, um, and they needed someone to just do a line and, and the studio didn't want to pay for it. I would just kind of step in, but I think my big break, um, at the studio came when I was directing a kid session and I, or I was helping out and there was a blizzard in New York. Um, and so I was supposed to have four kids come in and two of the kids couldn't make it. And we were on a tight deadline and we had to record. And a woman who serves as like the music director, she could do a girl's voice, but we really needed another boy. And I just said, I think I can do it. And I ended up stepping in for a three hour session and saying in the voice of a 10 year old boy and the clients thought I sounded like a boy and they liked it and it worked. And so I guess I realized that I had versatility and my whole life I've kind of been, I consider myself a character actress. And so I, uh, I started doing accents. So I've lived abroad. I I lived in the Caribbean. I lived in France for a little bit. And so I, I had, and I have family from the Midwest, the Chicago area. So I have, I like to do accents. And so I kind of, because I could do vocal tricks and so because I could do accents because I could manipulate my voice to sound younger and older and I liked it more opportunities just came came up for me and so in 2005 when auditions were happening for Oh My Goddess I really hadn't done much cartoon work at all but I knew the the gentleman Mike Nicholas who owned the studio who was going to do it and had called him about something else and he said are you interested in auditioning for this and I, of course, I was really excited because I hadn't really done any cartoon work at that point. And so I um, I got an audition and got a callback and another callback. And then I got Bell, Bell Dandy, not really realizing what it was. So for me, I wanted to act. 
that's like the, I guess the real answer to your question is I, I wanted to perform. I enjoy it. And it's something that I was really reluctant about doing most of my life because I was going to do something more practical, but I always did it. I was in shows and when I was a kid and in high school and I have a BFA, I, I studied acting in college, but, um, I was going to do something in medicine and something else. And I just kept coming back to it. And voice acting for me was just a great thing because, I, for a while, I, I had, um, I wasn't able to do dancing. And so this was just something that I could do. And it was allowing me to do something that I loved and develop a skill that I sort of, I guess, had, but I had opportunities um, to kind of develop it. So it was a co combination of, I kind of fell into it, but I also, maybe in the back of my mind, always liked, always was hoping that I could do something like it. I just never saw myself as maybe a traditional um, newscaster voice, but I just had these quirky things that I could do that just kind of worked out um, for me. Well, it seems that it, it all came together and now you're, you're, you're doing this for a full-time job and that's, that's pretty amazing right there. I feel really lucky. Yeah. Yeah. So like you said, you had some professional educational background. You had a BFA up. Where'd you go to get your degree at? I went to the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder, and I, uh, I grew up in Florida, but I, I kind of chose Colorado because I thought I would study um, chemical engineering and go to medical school <laughs> um, and got involved in a play my freshman year and then ended up auditioning for the BFA program. And it just, it, I just kept coming back to it. I actually did the Peace Corps after I graduated from college and did healthcare work um, and did some singing and acting when I was there, but still thinking I would do something in the medical field. And when I, when I finished, I just, I ended up coming, I moved back to Florida and got involved with the children's theater camp. And then I was with the children's theater company. And so I, I just kept coming back to it. I, I guess it just, um, acting was something that I love to do. And I, I just, as much as I kept thinking I should be doing something else, I just, like I said, I, I kept coming back to it. So, well, it's a good, it's a good place. You, you went to make your voice bolder, so you went to Boulder. I sure did. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> BearCastRadio.com. This is the Dennis Daniels Show. We've got Eileen Stevens, best known as Belle Danny from Oh My Goddess, and Iris from Pokemon Black and White. Now, how do you prepare for an audition for a, for a role? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I usually eat a pint of ice cream and no, I don't do that. I, um, although maybe I have once or twice, but I usually if I can get the copy beforehand and I don't always get that. And so copy for people who don't know is usually, um, a little blurb. It might be dialogue of a character that I'm going to read for. Sometimes it might be a paragraph. Um, so I, I, might get to look it over and then I can kind of mark up the script or something. Sometimes I might just get background on a character. And so I'll think about, okay, if it's supposed to be someone in their sixth, a grandparent and uh, she's from Mexico and, you know, how is this, how is this supposed to sound? And so I might practice some different voices if I'm supposed to sound like someone, cause I will do auditions um, for commercials and they, the, the copy might say, Oh, it's supposed to sound like Zoe Deschanel or, um, um, you know, another actress who I may or may not really have vocal quality similar to, but I can work on. And so it may be everything from listening to something on YouTube to, um, you know, looking at other things that, I, that might give me some indication of what they're really wanting to go for. And sometimes, you know, they don't know exactly what they want. I, I think because I was on the other side of it, sometimes as a director, as a casting person, you kind of know it when you hear it. And so I, I try to prepare as best I can. And then also know sometimes when I get to the audition site, things might be a little bit different than what I'm expecting, or I might get more information about a character. And so I have to be versatile and think on my feet. Um, and then also be flexible because once I do an audition or I'm in the, ca in the booth recording, the director or the casting person might say, like, you know, can you do it? a little slower? Can you do it a little younger? Can you make it more, can you just make it more fun? <laughs> Sometimes that's, that's, the, that's what you get. So preparing for an audition, yeah, it can be a mixed bag, especially if I get a call the day of an audition and, and I have to run there and I don't have any time to prepare. So I just, I think being flexible, um, 
trying to keep my voice in good vocal health always just because I never know when an audition is coming up. And then if I'm lucky enough and I have time to prepare, then I can, like I said, uh, look at the copy and mark it up. So well, good vocal health is really important and staying healthy because when you're sick, you can't fake it. Uh, I, be- I, be- I bet you do a whole lot better acting like you're sick than you would being sick. That's a very good point. I can sound very <laughs> If I need to. But yes, try not to. <laughs> Sorry, kind of kind of kind of kind of opened up the door there for that joke. That's good. I want to hear more of the church lady. <laughs> oh, well. T- <laughs> don't. Isn't that special? Yeah, I love that really, special. Well, isn't that special? I loved the church lady. I was really glad you uh you you tapped into that Dana Carvey. Oh, not good. I'll tell you what. That, that, well, actually, here's what I did. I, I took that. I recorded me saying Satan in GarageBand, and then I added a little reverb. So when it came out, you, you had that cool echo thing. And I thought, well, since you, you did you did voice up, oh, Elisa, who is one of the gym leaders in the Unova region, and she's got That's those great. short outfits. So, uh, we had, of course, we had to do the um, – <laughs> I want to try it one more time, actually. So, uh <laughs> So the question is, who dresses Elise up? Could it be Satan? <laughs> of course, half the audience is going to go, who, who is that? So, so, so they're going to have to YouTube that. It's funny because just last year, um, Dana Carvey came back to guest host SNL, and he um, did Church Lady, and he interviewed the Kardashians, Snooki from the Jersey Shore, and then Justin Bieber. And it was <laughs> it was just so funny. I, I, I tell you what, Dana Carvey has got to be one of the best people on that show, aside from Chris Farley. Yeah, uh, Chris Farley, Tina Fey is great. Um, I like Amy Poehler. I mean, you can, yeah, you can look at. There's so many different characters on that show yeah. over the year. I mean, Will Ferrell was on it, and I love the, the cheerleaders. I don't know if you remember that was also yeah. late '80s, I think, early '90s. It was, 90s, it was yeah. kind of. A break. Look, I would check out the cheerleaders. It was Will Ferrell in one of his best roles as a cheerleader. Who VA's like Eileen? Nobody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh gosh. I, 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 great. Now I got a motivational speaker joke for another for uh, for Tory Meadows. Well, Tory Meadows, you like hacking into computers? Well, let's see how good you're hacking into computers when you're living in a van down by the river. <laughs> oh gosh, I've opened I've opened the gates to a comedic hell. I, but I love it. Okay, so I, I bet I bet you get asked this a lot. But do you have a favorite role you've done? I do get asked that a lot, and uh, you know, I just I did this um, an Indian cartoon, and I played a role called Nasty Girl, which uh, I, no one is ever probably going to see it. But I, the voice was really fun to do, and I was like, that was kind of fun. I don't know. Was, was she my favorite? I, me, yesterday when I heard, I was like, I think that's my favorite character playing Nasty Girl because she just was so snarky and fun. Because um, I usually, I get typecast usually in the sweet character roles. But that being said, I I loved playing Belle Dandy. Um, it was my first big role and I did it for two and a half years and the people that I worked with became a family and she just made me a better person. So she wasn't fun in the sense that it was like she was super witty or um, comical, but it was nice. I, I enjoyed getting to, to voice her and play her. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess that's probably my my favorite role, but it's probably also tied into the fact that it was my first role. And so um, especially because there's so many people who are fans of All My Goddess. And and more so than anything else I've done, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about people watching the show and loving Belle Dandy and, and the character and the series. And so I think that that was probably my favorite role. Well, oh, my God, it's a, it's a classic, Eileen. I mean, aside, look, you got a, a kid, down and out, college kid, you know, kind of like yours truly. He makes, he makes a wrong phone call. Out of nowhere, a goddess comes in, thinks it's a joke, wishes that... She would stay with him forever, has her staying with him forever, and on top of that, she's a babe. Swing! But, um, you know, you know, why can't I get that lucky in love? You know, all I got to do is make a, a wrong call, you know, try to get some Chinese takeout, then bada-bing, goddess comes through the window. 
That's that's not, that's actually not too bad. And the storyline, of course, and you got all these crazy kids that are coming to live with them. You got you got Erd, who's kind of narcissistic. You got I'm... Scald, who's um who's all technologically, and then you got that you got that crazy chick Mara. You know, Mara, she throws fireballs, oh. bang bang bang, and okay. and you stop her with rock music. So many combustible elements, but overall yeah. the storyline is great. Boy meets celestial girl. Boy falls in love with celestial girl. It happens. <laughs> that is true. It does happen. It's like you you create a very. It's like you put that in a beaker or something in a, a chemistry lab, and things do explode. It just happens to explode on a cartoon. But I, you're right. <laughs> things do explode. So well, and yeah, I think Skull. She literally makes a lot of things explode in each episode. She's always tinkering with something that goes a wire, and then Erd is just she's. She's the sexy fireball in the episode, always kind of stirring up trouble. But the good older sister, she has good intentions. But yeah, it's a. I think it's a fun show, and I think it's beautifully, um, beautifully drawn as well. It actually shares a lot of similarities to a another show. I don't know if you've heard of a show called Tenshi Muyo. It's about a a boy named Tenshi Misaki, and he has all these girls from outer space come to live with him. And of course, there's the smart one. There's the there's the quiet one. There's the one that's starting trouble. They share a lot of similarities with each other. But of course, I don't, I don't know. It, it, Tenshi was more in high school, where um, Keiichi, you know, he's a he's a unlucky in love, good natured, kind guy. Who just who's had all this this crap happen to him in his life, and, and then all of a sudden something good starts to come his way. I I feel that oh my god has set the stage for a lot of these supernatural romance stories that would eventually come along after it. Mm-hmm. So uh, going to our next question, of course, your, one of your first roles was of course Belle Denny from Oh My Goddess. How did you uh, create her voice or her character? How did I create her voice? Uh, that, that's also a good question. As I said, I was new to cartoons, um, and when I went into audition, I did audition for the other sisters, but I had been told that she was sweet, and so my voice is naturally higher or brighter. I've been told I have a bright voice, I sing, and I'm a high soprano, and so I was thinking, you know, what do, how do I make her, I make her sweet? So I thought about people or images that, you know, that, that would that were inspirations for me, um, other cartoons that I had seen. But I had actually worked with Yardley Smith, who people may know as Lisa Simpson from The Simpsons. On, uh, she did a one-woman show in, in New York, and I was her stage manager um, slash assistant director for a while. And when she talked about when she auditioned for The Simpsons, she had said that her audition, and some of you may know this, but she literally auditioned in a parking lot with a little handheld recorder, and someone said, can you sound like a kid? You're auditioning for a, a young girl or a kid sister. And she described her what she did, which was literally just pitch up her voice. And I, so I, when I went into audition for Bell Dandy, I thought, what well, can I, oh, I'll just slightly pitch up my voice. So to sound more like Bell Dandy, I just pitched up my voice and made her more sweeter. And so I thought that's kind of what I did. I, I pitched up my voice, and then I just softened her, made her a little breathier, and I thought if I was a goddess and I got to see the image, and I thought, I think she would sound like this, not knowing. I mean, because she could sound like a lot of things, but the people that were casting it um, thought that I guess they liked my voice well enough, and they decided that that was the voice that they wanted for Belle Dandy. So that's that's how I... That's kind of how I created. I used some inspirations. I, I used what Yardley Smith had done. And then I kind of just melded it to what the image was of Val Dandy and what I thought she would sound like and hoped that that would be the voice they were wanting. Um, you know, I really didn't think I, I had a chance at, at getting the role. And then when I went for callbacks, I thought, oh, I did terrible. And I, I don't know if I, I got it right, but, you know, it, it, obviously it worked out. So that's my process. It's highly technical. Wow. Really. Working with Yarley Smith, that had to have been a huge honor. What's it like to work with her? Is, is she nice? Is, does she have a method to her madness? Is, just to work with someone who has been in the voicing industry for well over 25 years, to, to be able yep. to work alongside them, even on Broadway. I bet you learned so much from her. I did. She was 
very nice to work with. Um, I, she was incredibly personable and she was open. And so we would sometimes chat after rehearsal. I mean, we didn't really hang out so much because she was somewhat of a private person, but also the nature of her show, which you, you and, and the listeners can look up, I'm sure. Uh, it was called, originally I think it was called something else, but it eventually was called More, just the word more. And it was about her struggle with having the success as a voiceover actor, but wanting to be a big Hollywood actor success for being known for her face. So she, those of you who may um, know the movie City Slickers, she was the pregnant girl um, in City Slickers, which is kind of a memorable role. And she's been in, she's been in a bunch of different small cameo roles, but nothing hugely popular, but she was, um, her, I, I don't know if she really had a method. She did a lot of work um, at home, and then, you know, we would come to rehearsal, and she knew her lines. She had written her show, so it was very personal, and so I, I would follow along with the script, but she had had her lines memorized, um, and because it was a one-person show about her life, basically, it was very personal, and so... Um, there was definitely a process of her just kind of working through the material and, but she was incredibly gracious. Um, and like I said, could not have been nicer to work with. And I think she took some of her inspiration when she was younger, she has New York roots. And I, I think I should remember this, but I think she grew up in New York. And so she was actually in some Broadway shows. She understudied Cynthia Nixon um, for I think her first Broadway show, which was interesting. Um, but she, uh, yeah, she was incredibly professional and, uh, like I said, really nice and really gracious and receptive to when I got to direct, which was I was really more of a stage manager, although my title, I also was assistant directing, but I was really stage managing. But she was, you know, if I told her, let's, we need to be consistent or anything, she was always took direction and um, the comments really well. So, um it's nice to know somebody get to know somebody who has had so much success um, who really is just a, a nice person. There are plenty of students here at the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati who would love to get their break in voice acting. And uh, after a, a, lot, a lot of deliberation, and, you know, I've, I've been told this, I've been doing this show for about three years now on BearCast, and all the guests say that, that Dennis, you should try to do voice acting yourself. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to myself as well. Do you have any advice for those like myself that want to get their start in, in voice acting or, or get their foot in the door? Yeah, I actually had this conversation with someone today. I think knowing what the direction you want to go in. So voice acting, I mean, it's, there's obviously cartoons and anime, which is what I've they had the most success or the most notable success in, but I do a lot of audiobooks, um, and I also do a lot of educational programs. In fact, probably the most amount of work over the span of my voice acting career has been in educational programs. So kids are learning English with my voice all over the world and songs that I've sung. Um, not something that I had necessarily pursued, but a lot of my break, as I mentioned, was because I was working at a studio. For someone who wants to break into it, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. Um, some people will say you should get, just get an agent. I don't care how, what you do, get an agent. Other people will say, take a class, um, make a demo, and then send it out to agents. I think there's no one way to go about doing it except kind of knowing the direction you want to go in. Um, you already have experience with in front of a microphone and, um, you know, and so you know how to use it. You know, you, you probably listen to yourself. You kind of know what your voice sounds like. Um, when I was really trying to break into it and, and I put together a demo tape, I did work with a vo voice coach and she had been a voice actor. She actually still was and still is a voice actor. And so she had a lot of experience auditioning for things. And so this was putting together something commercial because I knew I wanted to go in that direction. And so she gave me a great piece of advice, which was um, listening to other people's demos, listening to commercials, listening to people's voices that kind of sound similar to me to kind of know what people are would cast me for, kind of knowing what my voice type is, um, which I did. So I listened to a bunch of people's demos. Um, there's a great website that still has a lot of... Um, that has a lot of 
uh, agencies on there. It's called voicebank.net, and you can hear uh, different agencies, or you can go to specific agencies and just click on their website and hear what the different talents sound like. Um, I know that I knew that I enjoyed cartoons and I wanted to work in that. And so kind of knowing what the different voices are out there, um, definitely helped. So for me, it was about making a demo. It was about following up with my connections that I had made at a recording studio. So I kind of had an in, um, and then it was pursuing that it was pursuing getting an agent. So I had had a demo, I had this experience and then I went and pursued an agent for people who don't have any of that experience, I think a good route would be taking a class so that you're maybe with a beginning class with somebody who may be an agent or someone who has some experience working in voiceovers, whether it could be an acting coach or a teacher from at the University of Cincinnati or another school who has some experience, and then working with copy. And so, you know, seeing, seeing what you do, do you, you know, do you have different voices that you can do? Or do you find that you have, like, a really strong lead voice or a, a great radio sound? Or, um, you know, can you kind of – do you have the sound – do you have a raspy sound? Do you have a more mature sound? Kind of knowing and getting some feedback. Read some copies. Try out some characters. A class is a good way to do that because you can hear what other people are doing, and it also takes off the – for me, you know, I, I've definitely had – periods of I get anxious about it and when I started out it wasn't easy I made a lot of mistakes and so a lot of it is just people will say well you can't get an in but a great way to get an in is just taking a class because you're with other people who are starting out um, I would recommend taking a class with somebody who might be an agent or somebody who does have casting experience because they'll talk to other people and if something comes up regardless of where you are um, they might pass your name along um, you know, the big the big locations for voiceovers, obviously the major cities, cartoons, L.A. is really big, um, Dallas, Austin, um, New York. Also, I would say those are the three big centers for cartoons and anime, but people are doing it in different locations. The great thing right now is technology. It allows people to record at home. There's something called Voice 123, and pretty much anyone can go online and try, you know, audition for something. If you have a little home system, GarageBand, you get a microphone or you have, I mean, you could get Pro Tools. It's, it's fairly affordable. And, and just see how you do it. See if you get a response. Um, I'm a big fan of, of taking a class or working with someone to get a little bit of feedback and direction. But definitely one of the best, best pieces of advice that someone gave me was, wait, which direction do you really want to go in? And I... I don't like to be pigeonholed because I like to think that I can do a lot of different things and I I like to try different things and so I am working in audio books and I am working in, in cartoons and anime and I am I do promos and I do other things. But my end for, for me was doing this educational stuff which is very clear articulation or diction, um and being able to do a, a nice range between teen kids to middle age. And so that was kind of, because I had an in, I, I did that. And so I, I, I'm saying a lot of different things, but use your resources. Think about the direction you want to go in and don't be afraid to try it. You know, um, every city, you know, if you're in a smaller metro area, there's going to be radio. There, there are regional ads that you can audition for. It may not be the national markets, but it, there may be, there may be a company that's auditioning for a certain product or there may be a campaign. I know Atlanta also has some agencies, um, but there's work everywhere. And the thing is with voiceovers, there's so much that are voiceovers from you go to a museum and you hear a voiceover, you call up an office and someone may have a voiceover. They may have done, they may be the voice of Stone and, and Lawson Law Firm or something. So, which I've done too. I've done voiceovers for law firms. Um, so I think, and you have to be a little bit, you have to be bold and at times relentless and not get discouraged because there are so many people that want to do it, but it's, it is fun. Um, but you do have to think of yourself as a business and kind of make a plan and just see if you like it. So I, I think there's room for people who want to do it. It's just a lot of it is taking initiative and, and taking a step forward. 
Um, and, you know, thinking about the talents, like you said, I, you, I sound, I'm, I'm not surprised people have said, um, Dennis, that you have some talents. I can hear it. You, you have a really, you have bit, a lot of good vocal variation, which is great. And you can use that definitely in cartoon work and to have, you know, to have that vocal flexibility to, and to be animated is really attractive. Um, when selling a product to voicing a character. So I hope that's helpful. No, it helps on a, it helps on a lot, Eileen. That is, and, and that's first off, that's first off, that's very nice of you to say, because. Uh, but I just I don't know though because I really want to go into radio. I've, I've booked myself as Cincinnati's next big radio personality, but I would not mind getting my hands dirty and and doing voice acting if I could get my hand on. Just the problem is that the market's not looking really good right now because you know the economy's in the, and it's just it's it's, it's, it's going downhill and. I just I, I don't have the money right now to be able to afford the expensive lessons or the coaches because I know that there are a lot of voice actors out there that do offer these classes. One, one person example being um back in uh, 2009, our first ever guest was Pat Fraley, who uh, did Krang from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He offers <laughs> voicing classes and people can go, but they're like 700, 800 bucks and. Uh, on a less than one fifty a week salary, Eileen, that's that's kind of a kind of out of the uh, kind of out of my reach. But you could go to Voice One Two Three, and I think it's free to sign up. And if you have GarageBand, you can audition for stuff. The other thing is find out find out what the recording studios are where you are. Um, see what they're doing. Call them up. I would say call up and find out. Are they doing Are they doing educational programming? Which is a very easy in because it's it's not that dynamic it's not as competitive they may not be but maybe they're doing maybe they do spots for the local um car car dealerships or something and they need a voice um you know a lot of it is just calling and calling again and emailing and following up and saying oh and by the way you know can i i volunteered my way i mean when i moved to new york i was living in a closet basically and i did for a long time um i still i I bike around the city. I save money that way. I don't take cabs around New York City. I, I bike everywhere, in part because I, I'm an environmentalist, but um, but also because that's my way of, of, you know, saving a little bit of money. But I followed up with people, and it's not something that I enjoy doing, but you don't have to have a lot of money. And I think classes are wonderful, and I wanted to make that point. But be creative is what I want to say. Um because there, there are always jobs out there. And I know it's really easy to hear the message, especially when, because I love getting news, and I'm tuned into NPR and New York Times, and I constantly get the update of, oh, I, there was something even on my phone. I, I have an iPhone where it says something like, Excellent. jobs are up, but, you know, the, the percent rate, you know, there's still unemployment. But the thing is, when people aren't working, they're doing more entertainment. And that's the bottom line. People are doing, ga- people are gaming, you know, games, especially the voiceover work for that is everywhere. I mean, people are making games all over the, the country, all over the world. And especially if you can get, you can start making contacts, then um, your name might be passed along to someone, but wherever you are, they're doing voiceovers. It may not be, like I said, the Bush, beer commercial or something or you know a national campaign is what i said with like bush beer or something um but they're going to be doing they're, they're doing spots there guaranteed i ended up doing a spot when i was i directed an audio book in louisville and when i was there the studio they they there was a snowstorm me and snowstorms i seem to be a winter person apparently um and the person the young girl she was a, a kid she was eight years old nine years old couldn't get there because of the snowstorm. And so they said, gee, you know, we know you do voiceovers. Can, can you step in? And I was like, absolutely. Which it was a local spot. It was a regional spot. So I, I want to keep you positive and the listeners positive because there are always ways to have an in. Um, and I, I look at Ryan Seacrest. Um, I read somewhere that he started, I think he's from Atlanta or he's from Georgia but he started off in a radio station sweeping the floor, and now look at him. So it's just there's always there's always a way to get an in. But I think making connections, you know, there's a way to make an in without spending money. I was a I was a professional volunteer as a as a Peace Corps volunteer, and I've 
volunteered much of my time, most of my life, um, in part to volunteer. And then also because I, or I didn't have the money to pay for things. So I would find alternative ways, especially in New York. I love going to shows. We volunteered. Uh, We couldn't afford to go to a show, but we could usher. So that's how I saw a lot of shows when I first moved to New York is I would usher. The same thing with voiceovers. You can, you can call up and sit in or, you know, find a way because there's, there's always going to be a moment. Like for me, my break came after working at the recording studio for a couple of years when this snowstorm hit. And then it was just like, oh, <laughs> they saw me as talent beyond being the associate producer director, you know, the person that made the calls. I was something different because I was in the right spot. But it took time and it took work to get there. But it, I, I don't. I, I think it was a good process for me because I actually learned a lot about the, the business in the, in the process, and I made connections by being in the right spot um, without spending money. I didn't. I didn't pay for acting class, or I should say acting. I didn't pay for a voice coach until I had long been in the the business, and I had the money to pay for it because it can be really expensive, and I don't encourage people to go and spend thousands of dollars they don't have. That doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me if you don't have it. Not everyone has a lot of money. So, but there, there are ways to be creative and to stay positive for sure. I got to say, wow, Eileen, I, I have, after hearing that, I have got renewed hope and confidence that I actually might be able to pull this off. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, out. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Oh, stop it. Uh, so, uh, com. This is the Dennis Daniels Show. We have got Eileen Stevens on the air, and I've got renewed vigor and pep in becoming a radio personality and voice actor. Anywho, another role you're best known for currently is Iris from the new Pokemon Black and White, which you can catch Saturdays and Sunday mornings on Cartoon Network. Um, How did you audition for that role, and and what do you think of her uh, character on the show? I will uh, answer in the the order that you asked. So I auditioned for the role because I had done some work on Pokemon prior to that character, or before they, they went to a new universe. So I had already done some roles. I knew the director when they were auditioning for Iris. He had contacted different act- actresses and then took recommendations for actresses, and I was one of the people he had asked to audition for it and got the, a re-audition or a follow-up, a callback, and then I got the part. So it was because I had been recommended to do art, which now records Pokemon um, originally, and then having done some secondary or, you know, some smaller roles over the course of like a year or two, and then when Iris came up, that's how I auditioned. And when I think of her on the show, I think she's spunky. I think um, when I first auditioned for her, I thought she was maybe going to be a little bit more fiery because she's a fiery person. I like that. She's definitely got an opinion. Um, I like that she's kind of, um, she's ethnically ambiguous and she's got, she's from the, the, She's from the jungle. She's from the the woods, um, and I think she's a good she's a good team player. She's definitely an excellent balance with Silent, who's much more polished and cultured. And she's just like it's, I always think it's funny because in episodes you'll see Silent putting together this gourmet meal, and she's just like, let's just have fruit that she picked off a tree. So I like her practical character. I I think she's a fun addition a fun addition on the show and. Um, very different than Belle Dandy. Um, she's not what I would call a soft character, but she's got a sweetness to her at times. And at times she's just, she's ready to, she's ready to fight if she needs to. And definitely has opinion about most things, which I like. Maybe a little too much opinion if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can see where some people may find she's a little strong and they don't like her so much, but I think she's, I think she's, she's fun. I'm glad that I get to play her. Yeah, yeah, and she's always going around telling people, you're such a kid. I'm not a kid. I know. You're such a kid. I know. You're a kid. You're a kid. (laughs) 
No, we'll save that. We'll save. We'll save. We'll save the uh, the funny character banner for for uh, near the end of the interview. Um, a lot of fans have said that Pokemon has lost a lot of the charm that it had when it first came out when Four Kids was dubbing it. Now that it's back with you know uh, Deval and the Pokemon Company, um, would you agree with this statement? Honestly, I can't make a comparison because I didn't watch it. I know a lot of the actors who were on the original, and I think they're all incredibly talented. I've heard that the direction might have been a little bit more cute and, like, sparkly and bright, and where now I think it's more action. Um, but I don't I, – I can't make a fair comparison. So I know what it is now, and I know the people – I didn't watch it when it first came out and when it was at 4Kids, but I, I work at 4Kids now. It's a great company, and um, the talent, a lot of whom I know, are phenomenal actors. So – it's possible. It's also possible that, you know, shows get old and people people's opinions change, and it might be different. You know, it definitely is different. There's a lot of different people working on it. So I like to think that it's still good, and, and I like it. I think it sounds great, but, um, you know, it's hard. I, I'm definitely – I can be a loyal person, and um, I can see – I can. I know that I've watched things when actors or when I've noticed things have changed or – like Kermit the Frog, when when Jim Henson was no longer voicing him, I was like, that's not Kermit. It's not the same. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I absolutely respect people's opinions that it's different or they don't like it as much. Um, I hope they still like it, and I hope they like Iris and Silen and, um, and, the, and Ash and, you know, all the new characters that are out. But, um yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully that opinion will change, but I certainly respect it. And I guess I should watch some of those earlier episodes with Misty and, you know, Brock and all of them. So. Yeah, yeah well, I, I guess uh, Celian is uh, like the new incarnation of Brock because Brock was the chef and the... Uh... And, and and the guy that did all the, all the camping stuff. So when he was cooking, you could smell what the Brock was cooking. But uh, I know. But no, no. I actually I have seen some of the black and white, and I do like Iris's character because Missy was just kind of a, a buzz kill. She's always going, "Where's my bike, Dash? You better give me back my bike!" And I'm like, "Missy, shut the hell up! It's a bike for Pete's sake." At least with Iris, she's swinging from vines. She's got a dragon in her hair. She's she's yelling at people for no apparent reason. And at least that's fresh. I mean, Iris, I could keep. I could keep Iris. So Iris is safe, in my opinion. Good, thanks. And, and, and Ash, well, I, I don't like the animation shift. They shifted the animation style. It's kind of weirder now than, than, than it originally oh. was but uh, then again i'm not a i'm not a big animation guy myself i'm more of a storyline guy and i think some of the storyline in the pokemon series and the video game for all that matter is pretty interesting because you got in the video game in black and white there's this guy named n and i don't know if, if you guys have started doing the doing the whole team plasma thing yet in the series but he he wants to free pokemon from the trainers that, because he feels like they should be liberated and, and free. And and, he, and when you get near the end of the game, he's got like this distorted childhood. It's like, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty Mickey Mouse crazy. So I, I gotta say, I'm amazed Pokemon is still able to come up with all this great, crazy content. And of course, more Pokemon. How in the world am I supposed to keep up after the diamond and pearl expansion i couldn't get all of them now i got a hundred more to get and i I, it took me like like six months to figure out that you had to trade a carablast and a shelmet which you voice by the way so that you can get a excalibur and i'm like i'm like i'm too old for this stuff just it was a big deal when you traded a Kadabra or a Haunter in red and blue to get a Gengar and an Alakazam, but now you got to trade two Pokemon so you can get one Pokemon, and 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 and, 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 and it just seems like it's gone. I, I'm having a big brain explosion from all of this. Oh, don't don't explode. It's just it, well, the, the name of the show is the Altis Explosion, so explosions are kind of them. Okay. Kind of, it's, <laughs> it, it's part of the show. Okay, well, it then explodes, but just a little. Uh, a fan question is, do you play any of the Pokemon games? 
No, I haven't. I'd like to though. You should because if you get I believe if you get if you get white version and you get to the last gym, guess who the gym leader is? Who's the gym leader? Iris. Oh, that I have to play. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know where they got that idea from. A little kid, and she's got a, it's a little kid with these level like fifty Pokemon. I'm like, oh, f- <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Enough, enough of crazy Denny mode. And now it's on um, back to the interview. Now, aside from anime, you've also done some theater, like you said. And one that stuck, one show that stuck out was the tragic and horrible life of the singing nun. Mm. What was that like to work on? And can you tell us a little bit about the story of it? Yes. Oh gosh, I should. I, hopefully, I can remember. So, um, oh, what was her name? It was based on an actual nun who was a singing nun, and she had a horrible mother who um, made she like was domineering and oppressive, and she became a nun. And she had this hit song called Dominica Nica Nica. Dominica, Nica, Nica. You can look it up. You can hear it. Um, but she ended up, I believe, leaving, and she had a lover. She ended up being, she was a lesbian, and then I I believe she committed suicide. It's very, it's very depressing. I don't want to sound all depressing on the show, but she did not have a good life, even though she had this really sweet song that was a huge success in the 60s because she was the singing nun. But the ba- it was the backstory that here she was, she ended up, she had a female lover, she left the con- the nunnery, the convent, and she ended up killing herself by taking drugs or overdosing or something. So it was, it was the, the sunny face of the 60s, the singing nun, right? Um, those of you who may know, there was um, a TV show called The Flying Nun. And so there was this very idealized idea about what it was to be a nun and wearing these crazy habits and everything when in fact you know the backstory was that it could be very tragic and in her case it actually was working on the show was really fun i actually played her the the main character um during a workshop or a reading and then i got to perform at this workshop in front of a bunch of broadway people singing the t- one of the title songs and then when we did it for the new york musical theater festival um they ended up going with another girl who was incredibly talented um, to play the lead role. And so I kind of played a bunch of different roles, um, which was, which was fun. And it was a great show. And so it was incredibly campy. The cast was great. The story was told through um, a, tr- a, tr- a cross gender, no, a trans, a tra- not transgender. <laughs> and Pam dressed up as a woman who was, a man dressed up as a nun and he wore, he was like, he's six feet one. Um, and then he wore heels, spiked heels. He was like a six foot four nun telling the story. Um, so it just was, it, it was very funny. I played, um, her mother. So I wore this crazy wig and I wielded a big, um, baguette because she was French. And so I like, I mean, I intimidated her and sang this horribly mean song and, I mean, it just, it was very over the top because it was truly a very sad story, but the writer um, and the lyricist and composer, they just made it into a very campy musical. And so when we did it, it was a fan favorite. I think we were like fan favorites of the festival and there was talk of an off-Broadway run and it just, it didn't go anywhere, unfortunately, but it was a great show and lots of fun and the music was pretty memorable. Um it's just, you know, you can only do so much with a horribly tragic story, and somehow they made it actually funny. So it, it did work. It just, unfortunately, it didn't have a life beyond the festival. That just sounds so sad. Jeez. It, it sounds sad, but I tell you, people were laughing. Maybe they should I have done a uh, Broadway play of The Flying Nun. Well, they, yes, but then, you know, this one had a lot of substance to it. People like a little substance if everyone's just like super happy happy and there's nothing really going on behind it then you're like really what happened no it was it was it it was horrible and tragic but that's why with a title like the tragic and horrible life of the singing nun it's an incredibly long title but you don't forget it (laughs) they they could have just put down the life of the singing nun and that could they could they could have they could have but i think tragic and horrible life of the singing nun it has has a ring to it it has a ring to it yeah but wow i mean i just 
I feel sad all of a sudden. Wow. Okay. No, break, break out of that. Break out of it. Right. So um, what is it like to go from theater to voice acting, and do you prefer one over the other? I'm not doing a lot of theater right now. Um, the difference between, and unfortunately, I, I'd love to get back to it. Um, the difference between the two, obviously, is one is highly focused on one aspect of your person, your voice. So there's a lot of, you're hypersensitive to how you sound, um, whether or not you're sick or not. If you're acting on a stage, if you have a little bit of a cold, you can kind of fake it. You're still using your voice most likely unless you're playing mute or you're a mime. But, um, I mean, the big difference is, I guess, voice acting, there's a couple differences. Generally, actually, I never have to memorize for voice acting, and I think that's, benefit if you're acting in theater unless you're doing a stage reading you have to memorize copy if you're doing theater um you're going to have a live audience generally when i'm doing voice acting especially with cartoons i have one director sometimes i might have a director or director slash engineer sometimes i might have a director and an engineer if i'm doing an english as a second language program i may have as many as five people in the room or i may have people online or um listening doing a phone patch but I don't have the feedback of the audience. So there, that's something that I really miss about voice acting because I love meeting people. I love the energy, the feedback. Um, and then obviously just the physical, the physicality of being on a stage and moving around the space and using every part of you, you know, using your body, using your voice, using your face, facial expressions, um, which I, I do when I voice act. I definitely, I'm a, I contort my face to get the right, sometimes the right um, sound. Um, so I guess those are, those are the differences. It seems like both stage and voice acting have a lot to offer. It, it, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. While one has something that the other doesn't, if you overlap them, there's something in between that they both share. And uh, I guess for that, it would be, of course, one of them being passion, because whether you're doing a show in front of a thousand people, a hundred people, two people, you got to have the same amount of passion that you would if you were doing a bigger show. And I assume that when you do the voice acting, you bring that passion from the theater into the sound booth so that you can can bring that emotion, that raw emotion, that raw energy and portray these characters in a way that, you know, that they, they, they should be portrayed. Yeah, but there is. Uh, yeah. But I would also say that when you're in front of an audience when you have the physical presence of people there's just there's a chemical reaction personally so sometimes it used to be if I was doing public speaking when I first started doing public speaking I might have slightly dry mouth I might shake a little bit I might like my stomach might hurt because I was nervous I don't really get that so much when I'm acting, but it might be because I've been doing it so long at this point. I probably did get nervous before I would go and do an audition or do a uh, recording. Um, but there's a big difference when you have a crowd of 50 people, 500 people, as opposed to one person. So I do, I, I guess you'd ask me, how do I prepare for an audition? I would say for voice acting, I have to definitely try and put myself in the moment, in the character, and I have to really just be in the moment because we work very quickly and I want to be, I want to be genuine. I want to be able to bring, I don't want to, I don't ever, I don't think any actor likes to dial in and just do the, the work because I want to be authentic and I want it to be real, but it's definitely, it's, it's a different feeling when you have a huge audience as opposed to it's just you and the mic. So yeah, you do have to work to, get that sound right um in some ways i think it's more intimate and more genuine when it, there isn't an audience and sometimes vice versa so yeah i guess because i'm not actively doing theater so much right now um i can't at the moment say where i'm at between the two but hopefully i will be well, hopefully you'll be able to return to the stage again soon, and it will be yeah. truly awesome. I, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to answer some of these listener questions. You can stick around for a few more minutes to answer some listener questions. Sure. Okay. When we come back, we're going to take some of your listener questions for Eileen Stevens. You are listening to The Dennis Daniel Show. Hello there. This is Mrs. Ketchum, Ash's mother. You know... 
when I worry about my Ash traveling to train his Pikachu and all his adorable Pokemon, I listen to BearCastRadio.com, celebrating ten years as the University of Cincinnati's student internet radio station. Come to think of it, I really do enjoy both the all-taste explosion with the Boogaloo Shrimp featuring John Pokemon and the Dennis Daniels Show. And to all their listeners out there, don't forget to change your underwear every single day. And we are back here on the Dennis Daniel Show. We have got Eileen Stevens, best known as Iris from Pokemon Black and White, and Belle Danny from Oh My Goddess. So without further ado, we have got a whole bunch of these questions. Our first question comes from Andrew Chris. Eileen, in Pokemon, Iris likes to say to Ash, you're such a kid. And Tori in Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel likes to say, Yuma, when Yuma is in danger. Does it get annoying that you have to say those same lines over and over again? I wouldn't say annoying. Um, predictable. I I think um, I, I I don't mind just saying what's on the copy, but I I don't. I also enjoy it when sometimes they change change it up a little bit, and I can say something different. That's a very ambiguous answer, but uh, yeah, maybe sometimes I would never say it's annoying. I always love when I have a little more uh, copy than less. So if I say you must 15 times, I don't mind. And if I say you're such a kid 20 times in a show, I don't mind either. It just means I get to do a little more work, and it's never the same, hopefully, each time. But I do like it when they change it up a bit. Well, it's kind of like a catchphrase. Like, like, uh, like every time that uh, every time that Iris goes, you're such a kid, you should have, like, some kind of, a, like, a, like, a audience laugh track or something, you know, like a catchphrase. <laughs> like, like, you know y'all want me, baby. And then you have the canned laughter, you know. Maybe try to make these shows more like a sitcom, you know? Maybe that'll get some more lists and more people to watch the show. <laughs> oh, that, Good that, idea. That, that, I'll, I'll bring that up with the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell tell Pokemon Company that, uh, we, that I think that'd be a little more enjoyable. Okay. Another question from Adam Fisher. When you were asked to do the twins Leo and Luna from 5Ds and even 3D Bonds Beyond Time, the movie, which we had a... Uh, Greg Abion last year, very nice, by the way. Did you hear any of Cassandra Lee Morris's old reels for the character? And also, which one of the twins did you enjoy voicing the most? Yes, I did hear Cassandra, Cassandra's voice um, for those characters. In fact, that was a big part of my getting cast because they thought I did a close match to it. Although I did, don't sound exactly like her, but they thought my my sound was similar to what she had done. So I listened to it many times, especially when I first started, we would listen to it a bunch of times to make sure I was as close as I could be to her sound. And of the two, Leo was, I mean, I always like it when a character's got a lot of spunk and, and Leo was definitely pretty fun. So I would, I liked them both, but I would, I'll go with Leo. Yeah. I don't know. You know, Luna just, she seemed more like the, like the, she knew when something was over Leo's head and, and Leo was oh, like, she, did. she was smarter, but that that's what made Leo more fun. Cause he was a little bit, he was a little out of it where Luna, Luna was definitely the Lisa Simpson. She was a little bit, she had things, she knew what was going on where Luna, Leo was just kind of a hothead and he didn't always know, but I, I, it was fun. I enjoyed getting to voice him. So I, I like them both. It's kind of hard to say one or the other, but maybe eking out Luna for Leo. Our next question, this is actually from an anonymous user. Which character do you think you most resemble personality-wise? Oh, wow. That is tough. It's a popular question on the show from the audience, apparently. <laughs> which which character do I most resemble? Mm kind of a, a hybrid I because uh, I've done so many kids and I'm you know I mean I'm just barely an adult of course so it's very recent being a kid but um I, I I feel like it's probably a hybrid of the characters that people know that I've voiced I mean I I would almost say a mix between um 
No, I can't say that I'm really Belle Dandy, but I'd like to say that I aspire to be a good person like her. <clears throat> I think I, I'd like to say that I'm pretty good at picking up on situations and social cues and like figuring stuff out sometimes before people do in the, in the way that Luna was or is. And I definitely have some spunk and fire. I'd like to think that uh, in the way that uh, Iris has. So it's a little bit of a blend between those three. Well, that's also a popular answer because we've had a lot of guests and they just can't pick just, just one character. There's, there have been characters that have defined them throughout the ages, but there are also right. ones that, you know, you're, you're more like your attitude wise, more like uh responsibility wise. You gotta, you gotta take yeah. them all, put them in a little compactor, you know, push them together. Boom. Pops out Island Stevens. In a sense, it's a hypothetical, of course. I it's know. a hypothetical. I mean, maybe I could even say Tori. I think Tori, but she's still pretty young. Um, but she's definitely, she's definitely got some, she's definitely got spunk, and she's she's a smart girl. I like to think that I'm smart, but doesn't always know it. And definitely, she probably likes, um, she likes Yuma maybe a little bit. And but it, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard. It's hard to say that I'm like a cartoon character because they don't. They're pretty, they can have depth, but they don't, I feel like there's, there's always a little something that maybe that I have a little bit more than just one cartoon character. So I see why the other people would pick a group of characters to say that they're like, instead of just one. Yeah, your character's got spunk. I hate spunk. Are you hate spunk? No, oh. no, no, no. That's, no, that's a joke from Mary Tyler Moore from Lou Grant. That, ah. it's a joke. He goes, you got spunk. I hate spunk. <laughs> I guess that's more of a dated reference than an SNL joke. It's I thought it, it was it was set up there. I set it up. I had to swing. You and hit set it, it up floor. nicely, and I totally went over my head. I did not know what you were referring, but I like it. I'm gonna now. I'm gonna have to watch Mary Tyler Moore. Yes, uh, curse you, me TV. <laughs> okay, our next question is: Are there any other new series that you're working on that you can talk about besides Pokemon Black and White and Yu Gi Oh Zexel? Unfortunately, if I was working on a new show, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. Um, Story of my life. Yes, but I mean, it's always a good question to ask. But yeah, so just I'll, those two. <laughs> well, um, well, which one's more fun to work on, Pokemon or, or Zexel? I like them both. I I I have more airtime in Pokemon, so um, I do that a little bit more than Zexel. But I like both. I I. The directors on each show are fantastic, um, and we laugh a lot during the sessions. And you know, sometimes they're it can be long and intense, but um, it's fun to work on. I like the characters; um, they're different show. I mean, they, they they have different different things on the shows, but I like them. I like them both. It's, I like them both because of the people I work with. They're all great people. I gotta wow. say, Eileen, you've got some pretty good company. You got Sarah Natachimi, you got Erica Schroeder, who actually, for some reason, likes our show. Uh, yeah, I'm like, you, you, you're, are you sure you're, you're, you're tuning in? There's another Dennis Daniel. Eileen, there's another Dennis Daniel that does radio. I'm, wonder, I'm worried if, if Erica might be mistaking me for him. <laughs> because, because, because we're kind of, we're not, we're not saying people on this show, Eileen. We're kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Well, I think that's good. Uh, yes, but um, I'll tell you what. You know, a lot of people say that they don't like Sarah as much as they did Veronica. But you know what? I gotta say, the girls, the girls doing okay for herself, and she's she's the lead role. She had the lead role in a hot show. Hate is gonna hate. Hate, hate is gonna hate. Is yeah. that what you said hate. Hate is gonna hate. You're right. They will. And yeah, I think she's doing a great job. And um. It's a lot of work, and she's been doing it for a couple of years, and I think she stepped in at a pretty young age, and it was a big role to fill, and Veronica Taylor is so talented and so wonderful, and um, but I think Sarah's done a great job, too. So, um, as I mentioned before, I can be a loyal person, and when something new comes up or something changes, I'm usually slow. To, to like something new and sometimes I may just decide ah, it's just not as good and I don't like it I, it's, it's not for me um, but I, I think I agree with you I think Sarah's done a great a great job and and she is a model so it's um it's not bad yeah. 
And the one thing I do like about Black and White is um, is Zora, you know, the, the little little the little Pokemon that can turn into people, but you don't know that it's Zora because okay. they don't talk. And, and even when she does talk, she's doing that. Uh, she's doing that. that he's doing that. <laughs> I like I like that. I like that. I like Zora. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I personally have a Zora in the game myself. Well, now it's a Zora arc, but it, it's pretty cool. I, I, I got to admit, that's the one that, that's keeping me hooked to this, Zora, because you think you see someone, it's not them. Our next question is, are you going to any conventions in 2012? Any uh, going to make the convention debut scene yet or anything? I'm not, actually. I was possibly going to go to one uh, in Daytona, um, which I'm not able to go to, unfortunately, um, I've only been to three, and uh, which I've, I've enjoyed. Um, Parietacon, which was new last year, I think they're having a second one this April. I also wasn't able to go. I don't know if you know, but I'm finishing up graduate school for speech-language pathology, and so the last four years I've been in graduate school while I've been working. So I've, uh, I'm looking forward to a little break from school and um, working kind of two jobs, but I've been to PriaCon, I've been to EXPCon, which uh, is in Jacksonville, which is a great um, con. That was my first one. That was in October of 2010 that I went to. And last fall, I went to the first ever RockCon, which is in Rochester, um, and a great group of people organizing it. And so those are the three that I've been to, but I'm not scheduled to go to one this year. Hopefully, I will uh, be able to go to one, and unfortunately, like I said, I not able to go to the one in Daytona, but um, I'm sure it's going to be a great event. Hmm. Looks like some people who are con chairs or listen to the show might have a little incentive to get someone pretty good. And I'm, I'm and guys, I'm giving her a personal endorsement from Dennis Daniel, the cult of personality. Eileen <laughs> Stevens is the girl with the plan or the woman with the plan. And she's got a voice to boot. She was Bell Day for Pete's sake. If that's not enough to get you to a con as a guest of honor, Eileen, I don't know what is. Maybe, maybe they'll have, maybe they'll have that uh, that ukulele guy again. Ugh, him and his ukulele. That's that's oh, nothing. I... Let's see him. Let's see him do some voicing. Let's see. Him, let's see him do that. Let's see. Uh... Okay. I can do a kazoo. I can do a kazoo. I can sing with my mouth closed. That's a fun See, part see, great. she can sing with her freaking mouth closed. And she's yeah. still not a guest at a con? Are you serious, bro? <laughs> Ugh, oh, gosh. Working myself into a tizzy. And, Thanks for uh, that. Thanks for that. I, 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 we, we, I, I know a guy who runs a con down here in, a, in a Fort Mitchell. We will see if we can get you on that plane over here. <laughs> Stat. Okay. Okay. Another uh, question. We actually got a, a question from our chat room. Did you ever have a bad day and then have to play Bell Dandy? And was it hard going from outside problems to Bell Dandy, who was so happy and cheerful? That's an excellent question. And I actually got that, I think, at all my panel discussions at the three cons that I went to. Yes. I live in New York City. Every day is a potential bad day. Uh, but the way I would do, if I was just finding that someone had cut me off or, you know, if I was biking or walking or someone splashed water on me or something um, or everything else that can go wrong in a person's life, what I would do as kind of my way of bringing in peace into the session is I would buy a treat for my director. And so by the end of our, by the end of all the recording sessions, by the, after two plus years, he said to me, would you please just start, would you buy me fruit or buy me something not sweet? It's not good for my waistline. But that was my way of trying to put myself in Bell Dandy's mindset to bring, you know, the, the peace and the, the goodness that she was. And sometimes it took me a little bit longer to kind of really lock into Bell Dandy and just her voice and her demeanor. But that was my way of processing out the bad stuff and bringing the good stuff into the recording booth and the session. That's actually a pretty interesting way to get rid of that hostility. And it reminded me before before we closed the show today that I want to um, thank Ashley Dorrell for playing Bell Dandy in the opening skit and as our uh, as our Bell Dandy announcer because we scoured YouTube. We wanted to get something special. 
now for our, our, our voice actor interview. So we scoured YouTube. We looked at a, a tons of demo reels. And Ashley's voice sounded so close to Bell Dandy, or to your Bell Dandy, Eileen. So we had to have her, you know, record some stuff for us. Help us do a little opening skit and, and, be, and be our new announcer. And, it, uh, we, and hopefully she did a, a good job. I think she sounded fantastic. Okay, well, I will pass that along to her and um, after too. the interview. And it's, uh, I think she's going to uh, really appreciate that. I will be enjoying Easter myself. And my family has a tradition called the Easter Egg Cracking Contest. What? Some of your listeners may know, but what it is, is you take, preferably, a hard-boiled egg, a side, and you pair up with a person and you kind of, you go head-to-head with the other person's egg and you tap them or like you crack them and one egg will crack and one won't. And the egg that doesn't crack goes on to the next round until there's one egg that is not cracked. And it sounds strange, like don't both eggs crack, but actually only one egg will crack. Unless the egg was already pre-cracked, which sometimes eggs that are cracked fall through the cracks, aha, because you dye them and you don't see that they have a crack. So they might be structurally flawed but one egg is usually the winner and then they get a prize or like a giant chocolate bunny so that might be something to add to people's easter traditions and egg cracking contest because people are like what do you do with all those dyed eggs that's what my family does with them eileen i gotta say thank you so much for being on the show this is truly a huge honor and guys catch pokemon black and white Saturdays and Sunday mornings on Cartoon Network. It's got a whole bunch of great stuff in there, and you can only tell it's going to get better and better. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. It's been fun. This is the Dennis Daniels Show, and we will see you guys down the road. Until next time, party on, Wayne. Party on, Wayne.